Um, this is our 16th year, 16th season of doing these archaeology cafes. So uh, this is the last month of 2022. The time just keeps rolling by. So um, we like to start with a land acknowledgement, acknowledging that we're here in uh, Tucson at our headquarters, uh, homeland of the Taun Autumn and, and the Pascua Yaqui. And our audience uh, all across the, the nation, um, take a moment and reflect on the place where you are tonight and the indigenous people whose lands you're uh, on this evening. So this year's theme of our cafe series is really about human relationships. That's our, our focus. I mean, the title is Better For It, Research Conceived in Collaboration with Community. And to be honest, in these kind of uh, challenging uh, times, I find the word collaboration comes to the fore very, very often in my uh, conversations and my aspirations that collaboration is not just about um, advocating, it's about listening. It's about um, hearing um, what, people have to say before you take action and, and uh, building relationships. So having the CAFE series focus on how different archeologists have um, implemented projects with communities um, and built those kinds of uh, collaborative relationships is the, the focus of this season. And um, we wanna, give our speakers the opportunity to share what was hard about it, what was fun about it, what was challenging about it, what might have not have worked uh, on some occasions, uh, and, you know, let all of us learn about this process of, of collaborations. Uh, we want to highlight, again, our, our debt of gratitude to our, our uh, cafe sponsors, the Smith family, through the Smith Living Trust and so there's Jean, Eldon, and Jay uh, Smith. I hope you're out in the audience tonight. Um, and uh, thank you so much for the support that makes this possible. And I won't go much farther here. Uh, Bill White, um, I first met Bill when he was a graduate student um, here at the University of Arizona where he earned his PhD in 2017. And he's now at Berkeley as an assistant professor. And I like, to, if, if our speakers want to expand on their, their background and, and the bio, biography, I'll let them uh, sort of do it for themselves. Um, but you've got a, a, a wonderful, I consider him very much still a young man out there, but, but he's in a responsible position now, not a graduate student anymore. And he'll be talking to us tonight about public archaeology in African American communities. So thanks. Bill, for joining us, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right, let me share my screen. I have some slides. It never fails how many times I use Zoom and then still have to figure out if it's actually working properly or not. But I, I think we got it going. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, give this talk about um, research that has really expanded more in my career recently. Uh, working with different African American communities. And um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about just kind of the pathway I've taken with these different uh, different projects throughout my career, but then focus on one that's ongoing that I'm working on right now uh, and and talk about some of the impacts that I'm seeing with that one. so i'm I'm actually not with everyone else in Tucson. I'm here in Hercules, California, on unceded land of the Ohlone people. And the University of California, Berkeley is also on that same unceded land. It's also an organization that has uh, tens of thousands of uh, unrepatriated items from different native uh, um, excavations that the university has done. So um, part of my job really just in general is to acknowledge that, but then do what I can to try to do some kind of restitution for what my employer and you know myself, what, I, what we're all doing here in the Bay Area. <clears throat> and so, you know, as that, as, is that as one of the main motivations for me, as far as my own career, I also apply that to the other communities in which I work 
which includes uh, several different black communities in the United States. So uh, I'm, my talk, I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time for questions at the end. You know, I'll talk about myself and my, my career, how I got started working on these different African-American sites, but then I wanna um, talk a little bit about some of the things that I've noticed through these different projects. And then uh, some of the, th how this positions in this really unique term that we're seeing in, in archeology span in the United States. I started my career um, getting paid to do archaeology in 2004. Before that, I was a student who was uh, volunteering on sites uh, and doing my uh, education. But in 2004, I started working in cultural resources. And for the longest time, I uh, worked on projects mainly in the American West. So I, I did my undergrad at Boise State, and then I finished my master's at Idaho. And soon after that, I got a job uh, with a company in Seattle, and I worked there for about three years. And then I moved to another couple companies in Tucson. So for nine years, I did projects, um, you know, in all kinds of different contexts and different environments and with different clients. And th it, that was really great because uh, it gave me a lot of experience. If you do uh, cultural resources, you know, you get used to a lot of different kinds of archaeology and a lot of different ways of working and working with um, different sites from different time periods. Uh, but one of the things that I always wished I could do more of was connect with the communities that I was working with. And every now and then there were opportunities to uh, work with folks who were members of different tribes or different uh, communities, Japanese American, African American communities, different Hispanic groups. But that was uh, you know, limited by my obligations as a contracted employee doing these consulting services. So when I went back for my um, uh, PhD at the University of Arizona, one of the main things that I was interested in was uh, uh, community-based work, working with different communities. So a couple of things uh, specifically about, um, you know, working with African-American sites. Uh, a lot of this stuff also rhymes with working with other uh, communities, disenfranchised folks, mostly people of color, but also poor white communities. That you find that the work you're doing is always um, exploratory and um, reveals a lot of things because a lot of times the history of these different sites has not been uh, written down or acknowledged. The United States is just like most other modern countries in that it has its own um, its own historical narrative that's really supported by the different systems like cultural resources, the different museums we have, our education system, all these things. Um, they support this this narrative of um, uh, history of the United States that doesn't always acknowledge these unique histories or the histories of people who uh, were disenfranchised, including African American folks. So all the time when you're working here, you're you know you're creating a new pathway that a lot of times uh, contests what's commonly thought about these places. So another thing too uh, in the United States when we talk about people of African American or African descent. We're, uh, you know, a lot of times really focusing on uh, all the tragedy that happened through the structures of racism and capitalism and uh, colonialism that affected people of African descent in the United States. Um, but a lot of times when you're actually, you know, talking with black elders and working with folks from churches and young people, they want to know about the past and they want to know a different version of the past that's going to help them uh, recognize how strong folks are and how they have survived through all kinds of things, including the echoes of the um, in inequity and injustice that still continues happening in the United States today. So a lot of times when you're working with black communities, they're looking for stuff that's a source of uh, pride <clears throat> that's going to work against those kinds of you know, narratives that make black people see like they're disemp disempowered and you know, um, that we're constantly victims. The other thing that ends up happening, because there's more than one way to see all these different sites, is that uh, it's emotional. You start getting into these stories. You know, one major aspect of Black history is repressing a lot of things because a lot of folks don't want to talk about or think about the things that happened in the past. And so what ends up happening is, you know, um, you, you touch emotions and there can be all kinds of different responses from folks in the community. But the other thing that happens, because a lot of times the archaeologists you're working with are uh, of European descent, um, they don't necessarily have the same connection. And a lot of times 
hearing what other white communities have done to black people will create another kind of silence and another kind of withdrawal because of the, you know, how it also touches deep nerves of shame and regret. And so you, you, you're working on these sites and you're doing archaeology, just like we all learn in school with our uh, methods and theory. But then we end up in the space where it's impossible to really separate yourself from the entanglement between these different emotions that come up during the work. <clears throat> and um, one thing that I've also noticed is that working on these different sites and definitely engaging with ancestors and descendants is um, you can really learn a lot about what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a citizen of the United States uh, in the modern world that we live in by listening. And the more you listen, the uh, better of a chance of understanding what you're doing you have. And the less listening you do, the uh, larger your chance of being rejected by the community. And, and so many times these sites and projects have been sitting here for a long time because scholars came, but they, they weren't really listening to the black community. And so just folks withdraw and they're not, they're not interested in working with them. And then the projects don't move forward until the right uh, group of people comes along. So uh, some of this stuff is similar to other uh, um, people of color working with other folks in the United States. Um, but these are just some things that I've noticed by doing this for the last few decades. <clears throat> it's interesting to say I've been doing it for decades. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I did my master's uh, at the University of Idaho, but I was working on a project that was supported by uh, the University of Maryland and the uh, University of Illinois at the new Philadelphia town site, which at the time it was an archeological site. It's now a national historic monument. And so the work was on this, a property that was purchased from a person who was enslaved formerly. He bought his entire family out of slavery, bought this land from veterans of the War of 1812 in Illinois and platted the town that the first town that we know of that was platted and subdivided by an African-American in Illinois. And throughout that entire process, we were working with folks who owned the land. We were working with uh, people of African descent who um, were familiar with the site, who had stories and connections and ancestry with the site. And so from you know the get-go of working with uh, Black communities, my first experiences were always these engaged participatory experiences. And so I brought a lot of that later on when I was doing a public archaeology project in Idaho in the River Street neighborhood, which is a multiracial neighborhood. And because of uh, segregation, it ends up being the place where all people of African descent are forced to live until uh, the first Civil Rights Act allows uh, housing throughout the, the rest of the city, or the first Fair Housing Act. So this ends up becoming known as the Black neighborhood, even though it's a multiracial space. Well, our excavations focused on several different lots that were owned by African-American families. And in the process, not only were we talking with elders and other community members, but we were getting uh, local youth to volunteer, folks who were used to volunteering for archeology span projects, and so the people who were just volunteering to do archeology span end up getting in this other kind of uh, more anthropological approach where elders are telling oral histories, we're recording uh, histories and, and, and you know, folks are learning about these stories of the past as they also learn about archeology. span And so it's a good way for kids are quite interested, you know, folks who studied archeology span but didn't make it a, a job or a career, they get to come out, but then in the pathway they or in the process of doing that, they end up in this uh, trajectory towards learning about race and racism in a place like Boise, Idaho. And that brings me to my more recent work in the Virgin Islands. In 2017, I was uh, part of a group of folks with the Society of Black Archaeologists who went down after two hurricanes hit the island of St. Croix uh, in 2017 to do damage assessment to historic properties. And the place where we have been working there is administered and owned by the Nature Conservancy and it's on the National Register. And so they were looking for qualified archeologists to go and, and uh, check out how the hurricanes had adversely affected these sites. Uh, we had also been invited to do archeological field schools and we were able to secure funding. And um, uh, starting in 2017, uh, we did our first um, uh, kind of uh, public archaeology project, but it grew into a full-fledged archaeological field school that's been held for several years at the Estate Little Princess. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a second, but um, it's really designed for folks of African descent to learn basic archaeological method and theory, 
but also um, connect with these kind of pasts that are not recorded in the history books and that uh, can only be found between the lines in archival documents and in archaeological remains. Uh, a couple of things that I've learned over the years of doing archaeology in African American communities. I mean, the first thing, first and foremost, is to recognize that the folks that the Census Bureau and we would consider, you know, people of African descent, um, they don't compose a monolithic community. I mean, sometimes uh, th when I say this out loud, folks, you know, immediately they're like, oh, yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. But on the ground when you're an archaeologist, especially if you're doing consulting or interested in public archaeology, you know, it's very, very difficult to find allies and accomplices that'll help you with this work because there isn't always just a, you know, registered black community um, a lodge where you can just reach out and you find all these folks that consider themselves African Americans and are interested in history. I mean, that doesn't necessarily exist. The the best thing that you that happens is that you get a lot of people of African descent who are quite interested in heritage conservation, in archaeology, in historic preservation, and they end up helping you. But uh, it's always important to remember that those folks are among a bunch of, you know, a larger population, many of whom don't care about archaeology, uh, or many of whom just think it's interesting, but not enough for them to really take time out to uh, engage with it. So uh, there's also, you know, no real federal mandate that forces uh, organizations to seek out people of African descent and consult with them or collaborate with them. So, uh, you know, you end up in a situation where the archaeologists are kind of the ones who are telling folks about significance or sites or, you know, these different kinds of things. When uh, a lot of times folks of African descent will be asking, you know, well, how come you think that's significant? Why do you think that we would care about that when we care about something else? Or how come you don't know that we care about this, even though you show up and talk about historic preservation? So, so that's, you know, something to keep in mind that I've noticed. It's a really diverse group of folks and the folks you end up working with are the ones who are the most interested and the most committed. Uh, another thing too, to always keep in mind is that it, it, the folks from the community are the ones who will tell you what is and is not African-American because once again, archeologists spent a lot of time in the United States trying to identify these artifact patterns and all this other stuff that would connect to, you know, people of African descent. And really you're talking about people who are, buying and making and creating artifacts in this uh, fully modern and, um, you know, well-developed system of material culture who are using a lot of things that are, sorry about that, a lot of things that are bought from stores, uh, the same stores that other folks are working at. So um, you can't really tell through artifacts. And then, you know, we know that historic documents also have holes. So you really need folks who are there on the ground who are familiar with that community to be the ones who help you interpret significant things for folks in the community, but also, um, you know, what is considered part of their heritage and what is not. Um, because the stories haven't been told and because, you know, um, history a lot of times was created to uh, enhance inequality, People of African descent, myself, we want our stories told and we also want sites protected. And that ends up being really difficult when um, a lot of times people of African descent are not the ones who own the sites. Uh, but another thing that I've found that's quite interesting that just kind of unfolds on its own is that um, we want to hear what happened before us because a lot of times those stories weren't told to us or you know, there's a lot of protective mechanisms preventing those things from coming out. Uh, and so a lot of times archaeology reveals things about the past that were never passed down and were never told. So it ends up being this other source of positive motivation to know that folks were here and they were living in a certain way and they had families and they overcame all these other things that it's very difficult for us to even imagine people overcoming. And so, you know, that's that's not the complete list uh, of all the things that I've uh, noticed, but um, definitely some of the things that I see come up a lot when I talk to other archaeologists about engaging with Black communities. All right, as I move forward, I want to talk a little bit about this ongoing project that I have going on in the Virgin Islands uh, with the Society of Black Archaeologists and other colleagues. So as I mentioned before, uh, my work has always been uh, centered in community-based participatory work, but I'm also working amongst a group of colleagues that they they value that as well. 
And so, you know, you see this, this thing here that's got these different divisions and it looks like, you know, things are operating in these different columns, but the reality is it's all a network that's all connected together. You know, people on the island, people off island, uh, folks that we have um, built scholarly connections with in Denmark, you know, all these different things have all come together uh, to help enhance this archeology span project at the Estate Little Princess. And so we've really been fortunate to have support from these organizations like the Nature Conservancy who gives us permission to dig there and um, you know, uh, lets us work at a national register site. The Slave Rex project through the Smithsonian and Diving with a Purpose have always been um, instrumental in supporting black archeology, span including the projects we've got. And then of course, uh, the universities that we work for and um, uh, the Historic Preservation Organiz uh, State Historic Preservation Office of the uh, territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, we also have several folks on island, artists, scholars, historians, longtime residents who have been collaborating with us, including Frandel Girard with the Crucian Heritage and Nature Tourism uh, uh, Organization and Chenzira Davis Kahina at the University of the Virgin Islands. Uh, my colleagues, of course, right there, I, I put us in the center as if we're the most important, but the reality is, you know, it's the students that we work with, it's the people who are there on the island, the descendants with this traditional knowledge, who know these different places and sites, who know the plants and the landscape and can uh, tell us this stuff. Um, folks who want their kids to learn about archeology span who come out from the island and participate in our youth archeology span program. You know, we're just the ones who help facilitate and channel this work into uh, something that we hope will help build capacity and give folks a chance to see that Black folks do archaeology. So here's an overview of the island of St. Croix. It's one of three main islands in the um, United States Virgin Islands. This is showing you the location of the archaeological project that we work on. Uh, St. Croix is the biggest of the Virgin Islands. I don't know the population right now. I know that um, uh, the territory has taken a hit since 2017 when many people left the island uh, after the hurricanes. Uh, but St. Croix has the most people on island. And as you can tell, it's it's been extensively modified by development. And that southern part there, you can see the airport, but also a very large oil refinery. Uh, the oil refinery is one of the biggest employers on the island. And uh, the other thing that's it's kind of difficult for you to see is that the places that are not developed with houses and subdivisions are really rugged hills that it's difficult for you to develop or build anything on. So this entire thing that you're seeing here has been absolutely enhanced over the last 500 years from what it originally was. And um, when we talk about the archaeology on St. Croix, we're looking at the latest stage of in a long line of development. Uh, starting back thousands of years ago, but really, uh, you know, terraforming the island over the last 500 years. We haven't found um, any indigenous uh, archaeological remains at the Estate Little Princess, but this is an overview of the property where we're working on the core piece of land that's still intact, that's administered by the Nature Conservancy. The estate was actually larger than this, but um, over the years, pieces have been subdivided off. Uh, for a long time, St. Croix was occupied and used by indigenous folks, Arawak and Carib uh, archaeological cultures. And, you know, people who were part of those ethnicities when the Spanish arrived were part of, were, were living on the landscape. They were utilizing this place for a long time. In 1493, Columbus, uh, on his second voyage, lands on St. Croix. And that really kicks off the intervention of people of European descent and African descent being active on the island. For years, uh, the Spanish Empire tried to assert dominion over St. Croix, but it was English and French folks and uh, Dutch uh, um, uh, investors and other people who were interested in plantation economy that were on the island. They kept setting up uh, different plantations and there was all kinds of uh, battles over this place until the French end up being the ones who get uh, um, title to it and it's bought in 1733 by uh, Denmark. For years, there had already been different kinds of plantations and different kinds of uh, agricultural um, uh, businesses there on the island uh, that involved enslaved African laborers. But it wasn't until the Danish takeover 
uh, that it really accelerates and there is a wide um, explosion of sugar plantations across the island and every bit that was level enough to cultivate sugarcane was uh, stripped bare of vegetation and planted with sugarcane. And for uh, quite a while, you know, more than a hundred years, the entire island's economy was just oriented a hundred percent towards sugar production and cultivation. Uh, the Estate Little Princess was established in 1739 through some Danish investors. So soon after uh, the Danish uh, kingdom takes over this island, investors from Denmark start setting up these different um, sugar plantations. And it was worked by enslaved labor. Uh, some of the records show up to 100 individuals are here. Uh, some of the records show there's you know, 20, 30 folks. But there was an entire village of enslaved uh, African housing that was south of the main house on this. That's where we really focused our excavation. So in 1848, folks on St. Croix, African folks emancipate themselves by marching towards the forts and uh, demanding freedom. They get emancipated. But then after that, there's an onerous system of contract labor that takes the place of enslavement where folks are locked into these contracts. Uh, and, and those contracts, um, you know, keep people in poverty, even though they're not enslaved, folks are still living in these cabins where enslaved folks once occupied. And at the Estate Little Princess, there was folks who were living in the former uh, slave cabins until uh, the 1980s. Uh, over time, there was just a lot more competition in the sugar cultivation industry around the world. And uh, the uh, Virgin Islands had been damaged ecologically from being turned into one huge sugarcane field and they were unable to make money on sugar. And that's one of the main motivators to push the Danish kingdom to sell these islands. The United States purchases them in uh, 1917 uh, as we enter the First World War to prevent Germany from taking over the islands because if Germany takes over Denmark, then they have these islands that are close to Florida and the United States. The United States has, has kept this as a territory uh, ever since 1917. And um, there was a whole transformation of more industrializing the island after the United States takes over. So sugarcane, I think they still cultivate some as kind of a um, tourist type thing. I mean, there's there's been calls to resurrect sugarcane cultivation on the island by investors, but those aren't really, um, they're not really well met by folks who are the descendants of the enslaved folks who for uh, generations cultivated sugarcane. So uh, there is some cane you can see growing there, but it's not an actual economic industry. Most of it is focused on the oil refining and other services. The project that brings us, that really enables us to be able to do archeology span there uh, at Estate Little Princess, which is one of dozens of extant um, sugar plantations that are on the island of St. Croix, is the University of California's Historically Black Colleges and Universities Initiative. And that's the, the funding source that really is aimed towards um, helping the University of California system recruit more people of African descent into the universities. Um, so folks who uh, qualify for the program that, that work with us, um, the, the funding is set aside for scholars to help hire black students from historically black colleges and universities and, and with hopes that they will go to a UC. In our case, we're doing archeological field work. Um, and so they come to California and learn about artifact identification and African-American archeology. span uh, And then they tour some of the University of California campuses. But after that, they come with us to the field and do archeology. span And so the students, they get their travel uh, costs covered. They get a, a stipend. And if they apply to one of the University of California schools, they can uh, get uh, admission preferences in any program except for medicine and law. So any of the programs, if they get into a graduate program in one of the UCs, their tuition is covered by the HBCU program, which is an incentive for departments to take on these black students. We had, we've uh, done several different field seasons. We had a couple curtailment years because of COVID, but we were back in 2022 for the fourth year and we have a couple more field seasons planned to be out there. So, so far we've, um, uh, trained a couple dozen individuals. Uh, and this, this, this program is covering the undergrads. This doesn't include all the other, um, uh, other scholars and the other um, 
uh, graduate students who have also worked on the project. So the students and us, we all end up in this unique situation where we've got these students of African descent that are on this land that's um, been part of Black history there in St. Croix. It's, you know, it's an ancestral land of people of African descent there on St. Croix. Uh, they're, they're showing up and they're learning archaeological method and theory. They're, they're, you know, doing everything that other field school students would do. But in a crew that's all people of African descent in a community that's 90% African descent and with a different kind of connection and reverence to the folks who came before us than you would find in a lot of other field schools. And so the goal is to try and teach folks, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of how to do archaeology in hopes that they'll go on to do archaeology, but also to make, uh, make it fully clear that this is more of a heart-centered approach that is uh, fully aware of the emotional stuff that ends up happening when you're in this kind of situation. And also the same kind of internal exploration that happens from all these students who start to think more about their own ancestry and their own families when they go back to uh, their homes. You know, they remember that there are places like that out here and that, you know, there's folks who are exploring these kind of things. The other half of it is um, having individuals who are there living on the island uh, come and learn about archaeology and learn that it's actually a real career that you can do. And so a lot of folks, you know, on uh, St. Croix students are absolutely bright, absolutely willing to engage in all different kinds of environmental impact uh, fields like biology, marine biology, um, uh, geology. But a lot of times they don't really think about archaeology as something that can help um, uh, address a lot of the problems that we have going on in our world. And so uh, in addition to these uh, 30 undergraduate students and these black graduate students, we've had you know, well over 50 youth that are from middle school to high school who come and work on our summer program. And so they come out for a couple of weeks and they learn all about, you know, what we found about um, a state little princess, but also they get to dig with us and see artifacts. And we have had some folks who, you know, they're in high school now, they've gone on to college and they're getting uh, jobs with the National Park Service. Um, they're uh, thinking about going into cultural resources right now in the Virgin Islands, it's companies from the mainland that are really handling the CRM obligations. And we'd like to see that more people who are actually from the Virgin Islands doing the work. <laughs> now, the other thing that I, I have to mention right away is that in this unique place here in St. Croix, um, there was already long existing organic heritage conservation practices and things that were going on that we just end up bringing archaeology to an already existing system of remembering places, conveying to young people, you know, the importance of plants and animals and landscapes and pointing things out that these different kinds of heritage tours have already been going on for a long time. These kind of walks through neighborhoods and conversations with grandparents and elders, these are something that are absolutely normal to Black kids there on uh, St. Croix, that they're not always things that are going on in black communities for the rest of the United States. So we end up in this unique place where we're just something that supplements what they're already doing. And by supplementing, we make sure that we share everything that we learn about our sites with all the folks that are collaborating with us, that everyone is treated as a colleague, that we spend plenty of time listening. And before we, uh, before we come up with our research questions, we make sure that they're in alignment with what other folks are interested in and what they, uh, what they already know so that we're not doing stuff that's already been done, but also make sure that the things that we get from our work, they add to what folks wanna know about the past. As I move closer to the end here, you know, uh, one of the things that ends up happening from this kind of uh, um, um, attentive approach is an idea that archeology span can help uh, regenerate and help restore all of us who have been affected by what's going on. As the world moves forward, I mean, we see things that um, seem like they were an oddity before becoming normal. You know, the, the environmental changes, the, the social unrest, and just the overall like unease that a lot of people are feeling, that's not, um, that's not just you, it's not in your mind. It's something that around the world, a lot of folks are dealing with. And, in the case of archaeology, we end up being hands-on touching 
the things that were created, the belongings left behind by ancestors. And so we end up being the ones who are right there using all of our skills and clues to figure out, you know, how people overcame times that were, you know, very similar to ours, perhaps even worse, uh, perhaps better than ours, you know. So we end up being the ones who are getting the original data that can be shared with other people. And we also end up being in a unique position where we can share this information and try to cause regeneration and cultivate, uh, you know, uh, confidence and strength among communities. And then the other thing for us too, as archaeologists and as people who are participating in archaeology, we're we're not immune to the same uh, uh, the same discomfort that the rest of our fellow citizens and neighbors are facing, right? And so we end up being in a position where not only are we collecting this information that stabilizes communities, but we can also find a way to work through our own selves and our own things that are going on and to think about how this practice of archaeology has affected us as individuals. So one of the things that's quite unique about the work in the Virgin Islands that doesn't happen at all sites, but it's happened many times and is, is common at African-American sites is blessing and asking uh, ancestors and ancestral spirits of the land to bless our work, or at least allow us to do the work without harm. And so each year we always have a site opening ceremony where elders from the island, they come and they bless the site and students see this kind of work. And I think that kind of sets the tone for this more engaged, you know, uh, spiritual uh, and introspective journey that a lot of people go on when they go here. They, you know, they tell us about how they started to think about these kind of things that they never necessarily had thought about what their great grandparents had gone through and what other folks had gone through. And as they move into other places, you know, we always acknowledge that we're on land that has been taken from indigenous folks. This is a pathway to start thinking about how that has affected people of, uh, you know, Native American descent. And so you end up with this kind of, uh, you know, uh, space where your emotions and your feelings towards this project are not separate from the uh, the excavations and the doing of archaeology. And as we continue doing this practice, uh, you know, more and more times, uh, those of us who have been on the project for quite a while start to come away with this feeling that, you know, this, this is the kind of way that archaeology should be, and that it's not an act, and it's not just something that's added on, that in fact, maybe this is an essential piece that archaeology has been missing for these many uh, decades and centuries. As I close here, I just want to mention, uh, you know, this takes an entire different mindset, and it's not something that's applied purely to African American communities. In my own career, in my quest, I've seen it unfold as someone of African descent, working on these different projects with other Black people, but, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really could become the way of archaeology in the 21st century, and so it involves you you know, thinking about this as being a part of the way you even consider archaeology and the way, way you carry yourself both inside the institutions where you work and, and outside. You know, of course, these kind of ideas of collaboration, but also recognizing that there can be more than one way to think about the past that are absolutely okay and valid. And that being inclusive helps more different ways of thinking be incorporated, right? Because there's more than one way to think about it. And that there's really an abundant amount of results that we can get out and that we can have more than one kind of success that comes from this kind of work. But of course, all that comes from uh, being honest, being honest with ourselves and being honest with the communities where we're working, truthfully talking about what can archaeology do and what it can't do. And then, you know, what are your, where are you at in your career and your life? And, you know, what are you willing to embark upon? So all these things, you know, I put this cosmogram up here, but uh, in reality, this should be just kind of the entry point to what's going on in the 2020s in archaeology. And I'm starting to see this come out in more literature and more of our professional organizations, the conversations that we're having right now. So it's not just me. This is something that's happening, not just for people who are studying African-American sites, but folks in the United States who are just doing archaeology in general. Uh, I appreciate everyone sticking around until the very end here on this talk. Uh, I also appreciate the the invitation from Archaeology Southwest. Uh, Tucson has a really special place in my heart. It's where my my uh, kids were born, and I bought my first house in Tucson. So I really like that place. And you know, if there's any way to help folks in Tucson, you know, I'm I'm never far away. And then of course the folks in in St. Croix who have 
accepted this outsider from Boise, Idaho, and, you know, um, uh, been willing to share and been willing to accept me into the community. You know, our, our colleagues that work there that live on island, of course, none of this could happen without them. Then also my other colleagues working at universities, uh, none of this could really happen uh, without my colleagues supporting my supporting me. We support each other. Of course, the students are the ones, you know, some of them didn't know what they were getting into. I mean, anyone who's done field school knows that some of the students, that's their pathway for life. And then other students, that's just, it was cool. They did it. And then other students are like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? I don't know what I'm going to do. So thanks, of course, to all the students who are part of this and the organizations that helped fund and structure it. But then, you know, the folks who lived through this life here in the, uh, the State Little Princess and beyond, people of African descent who lived and left belongings behind so that we can uh, listen to what they have to say. So that's all I've got for everyone there. I will stop sharing my screen and I hope there's plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much, Bill. That was, that was really interesting. Um, very, very interesting. Lots to think about too. So yeah, and I do think we have some time for questions as you guys know out there in the viewer land. Um, questions, just type them in the Q&A and I will, I will try to curate them and shoot them at, um, shoot them at our at Bill and see what he has to say for us. And I'm trying to make, there we go. I got my thing working better. Um, <clears throat> Ashley Thompson, who is an indigenous ar um, archeologist here on staff at Archeology span Southwest. She's actually got a question for you. Um, she says that really moving and interesting work, Bill. Can you share a story of resilience or strength for the, for the black community that you've come across, either for you personally or for community members or students? And thank you so much for presenting tonight. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'm trying to think, let me think. So, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to think of ones that I particularly, um, you know, it, there's just a lot, I think, okay, so one thing that I can think of uh, that I've been going down a rabbit hole on is um, in the Virgin Islands, there's a lot of really great Rastafari vegan restaurants, and I'm, I'm totally addicted to Caribbean Rastafarian food. So uh, um, at the site, there's these different ceramics. And if you know anything about African American archaeology, in the beginning, like in the 60s and 70s, there were all these questions about these coarse earthenwares in you know, South Carolina and Virginia, and whether they were made by native folks or whether they were made by Africans. And if so, you know, at the time it was, it was like, you know, how could Africans make a thing because they're slaves? And so therefore they, you know, so there were all these questions about who made these African American ceramics. And at the site, you know, the, the, um, St. Croix doesn't have very good clay sources. So you end up seeing these ceramics that are probably brought from off island. Mm -hmm. And even in pre-contact, uh, indigenous folks are not really making ceramics on St. Croix because they, there's not the clay sources. And so the question is always, is this um, Carib or Arawak ceramics or is this afro -Crusian? And a lot of times it has to do with context. And you know we're trying to build out our uh, understanding of the differences between these two kinds of ceramics. But that ends up being one of the main things that we're looking for are, where are we finding these afro prussian ceramics at our site? You know, what layers, what context and what features, we're really paying attention to it because um, it's most likely people of, uh, in, of African descent in enslaved contexts are the ones who are using these. Because later on, there's much cheaper European and American wares that can be got really easily. And so a lot of times, these uh, vessel forms that we would think are everyday stuff get replaced by stuff like teacups and iron stone and you know whiteware later on in time. Well, uh, as I was going through the island and trying to find every excuse to eat Afro-Caribbean food, I noticed that a lot of the places have these same ceramics that are these coarse earthenwares that are you know pots and stuff. They buy them from different islands. They're still made by people of African descent on other islands that are brought in by these uh, Rastafarian restaurant owners. And so I asked them, you know, I was, I looked and I said, well, wait, where'd you get that? Like, what, what's going on there? And they said, oh, well, I use that 
to cook. And I was like, well, what are you making? And they're like, your lunch, that's what I make. And, I'm, and then I was saying, well, you know, how come with all this stuff that you have available, why would you be using these? And they're like, well, we have to use these because the food won't taste right. And, um, you know, they have to be made in these certain places and I only get them from certain folks and I have to use them on certain recipes or it won't, it won't be right. And it's not just one, it's like several of the black kitchens are cooking with these pots. Mm -hmm. and, and so you start to see that there's like a long, long time that folks are using them there on St. Croix in the Caribbean. A lot of times these folks aren't even all from that island. They're from other Caribbean islands. They just cook in that food tradition. And that one of the main morphological things that we're seeing is that it is people who have knowledge of making ceramics from West Africa. They already have these long ceramic traditions. They end up making the stuff in these different Caribbean islands. And it ends up being a source of revenue for black folks, but it also ends up being a thing that folks who own black people can make them make ceramics and make money off of them, but that they end up being used by black people long after emancipation. And that there's certain kinds of things that, I mean, you only can make those with those. It was really interesting to see that, that, you know, it, we would think that it's, you know, people who have been crushed by the world um, being forced to make ceramics but then you end up seeing that it's a cultural thing that has a long that has a long history in West Africa that ends up carrying on today. And when you you know you're just a tourist and you're going along and you're getting your food, a lot of times you don't really think about what's going into it. And so that was you know just the longevity of so many different generations using these kind of coarse ceramics to make dishes they probably have been making for you know generations as well. It's just at a certain point, you kind of realize like, wow, that's a, a chain unbroken from West Africa, still a variant, still happening in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you, how did you get into archaeology as a profession? Um, coming out of Idaho, I think you said? I mean, were you inspired by anyone in particular? Yeah, Indiana Jones movies and Star Wars. When I was a boy, I wanted to either be an astronaut or an archaeologist. I was born in 1979, and when I was a boy, it was like those were the movies I was watching with my family. And I didn't, uh, when I was in high school in Idaho, I realized that I was too tall to fit into a NASA suit. They didn't have SpaceX, so it was like NASA or nothing. I'm too tall. So I dropped out of all my math and got like AP American history and stuff. And when I was taking my um, aptitude test in high school, archaeology wasn't a career that showed up. Mm -hmm. So so I didn't think I could do it because I didn't think it was anything real. And I started as an undergrad as a marketing major. And on the very first day, I realized I'd made a bad mistake because I had an economics class. And I was like, I don't know anyone in the world who thinks this way and makes economic decisions like this. This is like a bad choice. No one thinks like this, which is why, you know, our economics is the way it is right <laughs> explaining very simple things that anthropologists have already known for a long time or right. going into very elaborate math that explains very simple context archaeologists have already known for a long time so uh i i realized i made a mistake and then my next class i learned the four fields of anthropology were archaeology uh, cultural anthropology linguistics and physical and so i was like oh that's why there's no archaeology major I have to be an anthropology major. And so I switched majors that day. Yeah. So that that's how I, I always wanted to be an archaeologist from the time I was a little boy. And so, you know, astronaut was my backup career. Glad I was pretty good at archaeology because I don't know if I would have made it as an astronaut. Well, they both start with A, so, you know, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know how it was going to come together or what for years and years. I had no idea. Like I said, at every point, people had told me it's not a real job. You can't, you, it's not a job. And so I didn't know you could really do it, but I just didn't listen to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any personal connections to that project that you did in, Bo in Boise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in Boise. So that was a neighborhood that the neighborhood's going down. It's getting gentrified and reconstructed. It's been it was the focus of redevelopment in the city of Boise from like the 1950s. And the city has just never changed its course on uh, building things in that neighborhood. 
but it was a working class neighborhood, one of the oldest parts of town. And so it's just going down faster and faster. And when I, when I was going for my master's folks from, you know, elders I knew were telling me you need to do archeology span here. Like if you don't do it now, it's going to be gone. But I didn't have the skills to really do anything there. Mm -hmm. After a decade or so of doing cultural resources, it was a different story. And then uh, it was the parcel that I worked on now. Uh, it was it was like half of a city block, and the parts that aren't city park are all developed into condos. Mm -hmm. So that summer that we worked there was really the last time that anyone could have worked on that as open space. And now it's got you know. Uh, nice apartments and condos on it the whole neighborhood all the old individual um late 19th century and early 20th century houses are all getting taken down and turned into condos and townhouses yeah mm. so so can you can you elaborate a little bit more on you know what community participatory research really is you know what you know what do you find challenging about about it and you know what might be the easiest or sure i mean um what's challenging is that it's slow and we're starting to make more of a case for slow archaeology mm -hmm. i mean in the case of some sites people's heritage site is just eroding or falling apart and we have to act fast otherwise there's not going to be anything left mm -hmm. but a lot of times it's just kind of uh, you know, sites, places that have been neglected, places that are there that no one has interpreted, landscapes that are slated for development, but it's not coming tomorrow, or folks who realize that there's nothing to remember their ancestors in a rapidly changing neighborhood. And so then at that point, they start to think about, well, what, what can historic preservation do? And a lot of times archaeology ends up being a, a piece of that. So it's, it's community informed archaeology. I mean, uh, in academia, we can conjure up a pathway to do a project on like anywhere right that's what most people end up doing and then they grab folks from the local community and have them work on it and say it's community-based archaeology but ours is more like by invitation folks hear about what we've been doing and then ask us if we if there's anything we can contribute and then we ask them questions about well what do they think archaeology can do and then you know we're truthful about what we really think we can do and, you know, there starts to be a conversation that uh, the the work in St. Croix was coming from, you know, a couple of years of just conversations and going to the island and ta asking people and, and, and checking things out. You know, it wasn't it wasn't just going to a state little princess. The hurricane sped things up as far as archaeology because damage assessment needed to be done. Had we had good, better fortune, there'd been no damage assessment. It could have been many months more before we find folks who are interested in and work with us so that's that's really what i mean mm -hmm. by communities participating and it, i would hope that you know folks are empowered after this process to do this to other sites they don't well they won't need us right they'll they'll know how to petition the state historic preservation office how to recruit other archaeologists how to have people do the archival research and you know they'll know the pathways yeah well i it i i loved that term slow archaeology and You've got a attendee here who's um, wanted to say the same thing that I, I appreciate slow archaeology and moving at the pace of trust. Those yeah. are, those will be very helpful words as we try to figure out how to how to do this differently and better. So yeah, yeah. and a lot of communities have been really damaged by archaeologists. Yeah. Yep. And historic preservation too, because our historic preservation system is built on go to George Washington's house, save it and charge people $20 to go there. And so, you know, if that's the foundations of historic preservation, then everybody thinks of things in terms of bounded properties, buildings, uh, heritage tourism, how can we get people to pay money? And then they kind of forget about, uh, you know, how they bulldozed over the black neighborhood to build the parking lot for that, or how they failed to acknowledge the thousands of indigenous artifacts and features they've dug up. So that they can have, you know, I'd pick on George Washington. I don't know. They're not alive anymore to, you know, content. Everybody knows who George Washington is. So everybody, if you've ever been to Mount Vernon or, or you know, Ferry Farm, it's a really interesting place. I love Virginia. So <laughs> go check out, go check out those George Washington sites. <laughs>
<laughs> so someone was asking um, back on um, St. Croix, um, were any of the local students able to trace ancestors to, to actually lived on that site? Yeah, no, we haven't been able to build out no. the record as well. The records are not so hot for that. Mm. Folks don't have a last name. And, you know, we're talking about stuff that's documented in the 1750s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are just only marked by, like, gender and age. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, we haven't been able to connect anyone directly to folks who live there. Yeah. Oh, actually, you know, we, we have... We've had people who used to own the property before they sold it to the Nature Conservancy. Oh. They've come out, they're elders now. They talked about the place yeah. beforehand and the um, enslaved village was totally overgrown before the Nature Conservancy. Oh. And so most of those cabins were covered up by forest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, can, can you tell us a little bit more, more about, you know, what you're learning through the archeology span there at, at the, on the estate? Yeah, sure. So we, there's kind of two goals. The National Register form for the Estate Little Princess was, I think, accepted by the National mm -hmm. Register in like 1981 or 1982, and it was on the architectural merit of the of the place. Oh. So it really focuses on these main buildings that have been occupied, the main house, warehouse, and other structures like the uh, windmill tower had, was still there, the overseer's house was still there. And a lot of the sugar factory, but they they just mentioned the potential for archaeology, and never added it on there. Um, mm -hmm. After we've been there, we realized that the most intact part of the site, even, I mean, a lot of the site has been damaged over the years by demolitions and a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, there was a whole lot of stuff in the 20th century that happened uh, to destroy these cabins so that people don't live in them anymore without paying rent. So there was a whole bunch of stuff owners destroying the cabins to prevent people from living there uh, that's really adversely affected the site but we found out that the the place where the enslaved folks live is where most of the archaeology is because the, the maintained places um, there's not very much sediment and so a lot of the artifacts have kind of gone away and plus they were the open space thing where back in colonialism people would have came up on their carriage and it would have been a driveway and there's not really artifacts there anyway. And so um, we've done shovel probes galore through that dense forest and, um, you know, done units in the area. We're finding, you know, like I was saying before, mass produced stuff mm -hmm. is the name of the game, as we know, with historical archaeology. Uh, in the case of this site, um, ceramics, refined earthenwares from the uh, UK, white wares and iron stone in the 19th century, they end up being, you know, the real main thing. Uh, like I said before, those uh, coarse earthenwares, afro crusian ceramics in the lower levels and the features that are directly associated with people of African descent, we find a lot more of those. We find a lot more of those in the enslaved village than elsewhere. So not necessarily near the overseer or near the uh, sugar factory. I mean, another thing about the sugar, I mean, we're learning, I'm learning a lot about how sugar's processed, of course, but uh, you know, one of the main things would be to force individuals to process the cane all day and all night. Yeah. And so at other sites, they've seen ceramics and evidence of people living basically in the factory, like they just lay down and sleep next to it while they process more cane. Uh, we haven't necessarily found that uh, at this site. Uh, the other things that are really interesting is like the hydrological regime. We've got a great uh, scholar, Ben Siegel, who's working on this, who's been doing a lot of LIDAR analysis and looking at um, soils and sediments across the whole area um, with an eye towards water sources because St. Croix, it, it seems like it's a it's really a subtropical place. It doesn't actually get as much water and rainfall as a lot of the other islands. So water is a major thing the whole time. It still is there. And so these different kinds of water catchment ponds and wells and other things that are being used to convey water to the crops, we're starting to learn a lot more about, you know, how you keep sugarcane with the water that it needs, um, how you can provision human beings and have water for them on this really kind of dry island when everybody else is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've learned a lot of really interesting stuff about, you know, uh, just kind of water conveyance and how water use uh, compares with other more tropical Caribbean islands where there was sugar production. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds really, yeah. really fascinating. Well, we've uh, reached the end of our hour, so I think we probably should wrap this up, let you go have some dinner or whatever it is that you next have to do. Maybe you can find some, you know, vegan Caribbean food or something. No, <laughs> I've gone, I've gone all throughout the Bay Area. They don't have it here. Nothing? Oh, that's a bummer. Dang, you like think they have it somewhere. It is the other side of the country, after all. But yeah. call Bill they maybe they, they might not have those pots, though. That's the other yeah, one. that's right. That's probably the problem. Yeah. Well, I'm going to call. Thank you, but call Bill Doley back and let him wrap this up for us for this evening. Well, I want to thank. I want to wrap it up. Uh, starting with a big thanks to you, Bill. That was a superb uh, travel through a place that I know almost nothing about. But uh, thank you, and I really like. The fact that you tied one of my other current favorite words, which is regeneration, to archaeology, um, I, I'm, I'm impressed by that. I hope that the um, Nature Conservancy can create. It sounds like they're opening up um, avenues for the community to um, be part of that place, and that the story um, emerges as a very different story than what the TNC probably got um, involved with in the in the start. So. It's all an exciting process. And uh, we're gonna shift uh, a month from now in the, the new year, 2023. Bill, you can't think you're old yet. So <laughs> decades is, you got a long ways to go, but uh, a new year is coming around. So January 10th, Christopher Merritt and Karen Kwan uh, from the state of Utah will be talking about Chinese railroad, railroad worker experience in Tarrant. Terrace, Utah. Uh, I seem to have a very difficult time with that little phrase, Chinese railroad worker experience in Terrace, Utah. How about that? Um, so we'll see you in a, in a month, in a new year. And again, thanks so much, Bill. I'm I, uh, looking forward to look at your graphic again, in the, in the, which will, will, will be online here probably in a week or so. So um, that's an opportunity for any of your friends who missed tonight's um, presentation. So thanks again. Um, have an enjoyable dinner, um, even though your first choice won't be on your menu tonight. <laughs> <laughs>